Welcome back to Shat on TV, American Gods Confessional, the unofficial podcast companion piece to the hit star series, American Gods. I am one of your hosts, Gene Lyons, and alongside me is my co-host, Dick Ebert. Good evening. This is our fan email episode where we look back on this week's episode of American Gods and provide our feedback from the top listener emails for the week in a segment we call the American Gods Confessional. This week's episode was entitled The Secret of Spoons. You spent an hour listening to our ideas on Tuesday's Deep Dive. Now it's our turn to hear from you. So I'm excited. This is my first time in the confessional, uh, and I think I need it. I've been a, a bad boy. Uh, I had sworn that I would not come to the confessional because I didn't want to get tainted uh, by the sins of the book or uh, if you guys had dropped any knowledge that as a TV-only viewer, I wouldn't have knowledge of. But you've promised me that this will be a, a virgin book material confessional. Absolutely. And we're going to kick off with uh, an email from Jez Bell, who is one of our longtime listeners. She's been with us since uh, since the early days of, of Westworld. It feels like so long ago. And she's kind of brought back some Westworld style nostalgia, uh, finding Easter eggs throughout the episodes, which I found really uh, interesting because we hadn't really been talking about these Easter eggs that they're scattering throughout the show. So she starts off by saying there's a few Easter eggs in anticipation of episode three. So first of all, Mr. Wednesday's glass eye, obviously it's a lot more noticeable in episode two, but then there's some stuff that you might not notice at all. So I'll run down the list. One, Shadow mentions that he read 813 books in prison. 813 AD is the date of the coming to America story. Eight and 13 are consecutive Fibonacci numbers, which have been shown to correlate with the branching patterns on trees, tying in with the imagery of the world tree in the bone orchard. In Shadow's first vision of Laura, the imagery evokes crucifixion and sacrifice, and the blue represents the Virgin Mother. Hey, Mary had a kid without having sex, so perhaps there's another explanation for Robbie's cock in Laura's mouth. Okay, next one. In Shadow's second dream, there's an image of a woman and things flying around, including the Seven of Clubs. This card represents the search for spiritual truth and the ability to see the spiritual in the mundane. It is often paired with the Jack of Spades also known as the One-Eyed Jack, the black one, as its supporting karma card. The circumstances of Laura's death are a bit mysterious. The driver of the other vehicle seems to have fled the scene. This is shown in the uh, the news clipping that Mr. Wednesday hands uh, Shadow. Plus, she died in the early hours of Wednesday, and her obituary is on page 7, again going back to the Seven of Clubs. Now the coin that Shadow has. It's a 1979 Susan B. Anthony dollar coin. The first time a woman was depicted on U.S. currency and a symbol of abolition. Another point, Eagle Point is a fictional place in Indiana. The sign says Crossroads of America, the state slogan of Indiana and a metaphor for Shadow's current situation. In folk mythology, Crossroads represent a location between the world of humans and the supernatural. When Shadow flips the coin onto Laura's grave, it lands heads up. And in episode two, Shadow is given a list that clearly has two cell phones on it. Yet when Wednesday sees them, he chucks them out the window. Possibly an editing error, possibly could mean something. And finally, in episode two, Chernabog makes a big deal of Shadow being black. And as you pointed out, Big D, on the deep dive, Chernabog is literally translated to black god. That's it for now. Love from London, Jez. I didn't pick up the, the two cells on the list. I can't imagine that being an error. Well, I would have thought that it was just gifts that they were taking for the uh, for the Zoria sisters and Jernabog. But it's interesting that here here's the list that he's t- told the to shop for. State maps, earmuffs, a clipboard, a carton of cigarettes, uh, romance novels, a wheel of herbed Havarti cheese, and two cell phones. So it's, it's, every, every, each one of those has made an appearance in the show, right? So when the when the phone gets tossed... That wasn't a phone that Shadow just decided to get for Mr. Wednesday. It was actually on the shopping list. Yeah, but, but he only purchased one phone. The other one was his. One was in the package for Wednesday. One was his. He, he threw them both out the window. But every other item on the list we've seen he needed for Chicago. You know, the wheel of cheese was presented to Zernabog. Uh, you had the cigarettes for the sisters. Why would you bring, bring his cell phone? Maybe he told him to purchase them just to make the point of throwing them out the window. Could it be that obvious? It could be. So one of the other items on uh, Jez's detailed list 
uh, was the the circumstances of the accident. Somebody who seems to be as important to the cause and play such a pivotal role that his wife would just happen to die in a suspicious manner on a Wednesday right before he's getting released. Do you find that a little uh, suspicious? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's not just her, but her and his best friend, the timing and everything. Obviously, as we've seen that nothing in this world seems to be happenstance, that everything is put in motion, it just begs the question, who's behind it and and to what end? And, and I think it's only a matter of time until Shadow kind of puts the pieces together, I would imagine. He needed to have nothing left in the world to really grab onto. He wanted to come out and be a better man than he was going in. So he's got to put it together. This, When he starts seeing that there's bigger things at play, he's already questioning whether he is seeing the world for what it is. Uh, and I don't imagine when he finds out who's behind it, regardless of whatever their motivation was, that he's going to take too kindly to it. Thanks, Jez. Our next email comes from W. Axel Foley, our old friend from the Westworld Theory cast, who's, who's been on the pod before. He writes, Gentlemen, love your show. I have not read the book and really come into the show from the perspective of a TV guy. I'm there for Fuller and Slade. I enjoyed their work on Hannibal, and I expected a bit of the same, but I must say this show so far is verging on a copy of that style. I like it, but we need more story. The high-speed film slow-mo close-ups on water and fire and blood and more blood and more blood is visual masturbation, and I can appreciate it as metaphor, mood, and from a purely artistic perspective, but damn, it's repetitive. The dissonant music is as well. What's your perspective? I'll stick around, but it's getting tenuous. Peace, Axel. No, I can completely understand where he's coming from. I just wonder if they're doing this through the first few episodes to get everybody accustomed to the world, and then they'll let the plot and the story unfold. I don't imagine you could go at this glacial pace and just making it this visual eruption on screen. You have to advance the story. And I can't imagine them keeping this pace through the first season. So this is an interesting tandem of opinions. You've got Jez Bell on one hand pointing out all these really meticulous details uh, that could be symbolism interwoven into the show. On the other hand, you've got W. Axel Foley here saying, you know, there's this re repetition, oversaturation of sensory overload. And I, I see it going both ways. And one of the things I mentioned from episode one is that it's really cool to see this hyper stylish you know, again, as I said, it's very saturated in color, almost car commercial like quality to the imagery and the sound. But it does make you wonder if we go through eight episodes of that or two seasons of that or three seasons of that, are we going to be left desensitized? And at that point, just are they going to be able to up the ante more and more? It's like if you start off a song at the crescendo, where do you go from there? Yeah, and you also have to ask, who is the show aimed at? Is it aimed at the book reader or the general TV viewing audience? What percentage of the audience is going to be like Jez? Is going to dive back in there and find those kernels that are hidden in the background? You have to advance the plot enough and get people to buy into and care about the characters. You know, W. Axel Foley here says that you know he could bail on this show if things don't change. I'm I'm in it. I'm enjoying it. Uh, it hasn't turned me off so far, and if anything, I'm very entertained. I'm looking forward to episode three more than I was episode two, and that that's a good sign. Well, I mean, this is an entertaining hour of television. You don't necessarily have to enjoy the story thoroughly to sit back and just marvel at the artistry of it. Taboo was difficult. It was dreary. It was dark. At least this, I can sit down and be blown away for an hour. And for that, I'm thankful. Thanks, Axel. The next email comes from Nico. Uh, Nico writes, hello, gentlemen, I just finished up the first confessional and I had some ideas I wanted to share with the three of you and the rest of the listeners. I agree that I, it would be too over the top to devote an episode to the background of each god or use clunky exposition to explain who everyone is. As a reader of the book, I believe the carousel scene would be perfect to show both the viewer and shadow who everyone really is and what they look like. That's pretty much what happens in the book anyway. As for why Gaiman chose certain characters over others, I believe he actually wanted us to use mythological characters that could be or were real. For example, if you go far enough back in the family trees of Nordic or Germanic rulers, you'll see Beowulf or Thor or other legendary kings, or the fact the Queen of Sheba is a biblical figure, and Mag Mad Sweeney is based entirely on Bela Shubna. 
The list goes on for all the characters. I think the idea is that these people were alive at one point and were so loved or so hated that people's belief in them brought them to life again. Eventually, enough belief over a long enough period of time made them gods, but that's just my theory. Thanks again for the amazing podcast, Nico. Am I wrong? Jesus was a regular guy. Was Mohammed a regular guy? Could Mohammed it be that was they're a just regular guy. So it could be that they're just trying to stay away from some of the larger gods that might either turn part of the audience off or upset people. When you keep them more abstract, and again, I don't know what gods are coming out. I, I might get Muhammad, I might get Jesus, I don't know. Well, I think what Nico is referencing is that we had you know, an earlier email in Confessional 1 that basically said, why are they going with a leprechaun and not a fairy? Or why are they going with the Queen of Sheba and not Ishtar? So here is Nico trying to explain maybe the possibility is that there had to be had to be rooted in a person. So for instance, uh, Mad Sweeney is not just a leprechaun. Mad Sweeney is based on Bila Shuvna. So like it's it's basically saying that 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 just trying to answer that question of why did Neil Gaiman go with the ones that he went with and exclude other ones. So it's 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 a good question. I think it's a great theory. Um and it just remains to be seen or maybe you know if we hopefully someday get the opportunity to ask him. Yeah, I think it would be interesting while he was plotting out the book and doing his research to see who had made his board, what gods had he considered. For me, I don't know what's coming, and I think that makes it exciting that that whole opening coming to America now, I look forward to it. I'm hoping we get some big ones next week. Thanks a lot, Nico. This is really great. I mean, thinking about it right now, W. Axel Foley, Nico, Jezbel, all wrote into us. I'm learning a lot from these, and I, I miss this. Uh, I, it really does show, again, how, how awesome it is when you write into hosts at shadontv.com and share this stuff. Always smarter than we could be, just the three of us. And so we, we really do appreciate it. Uh, this one's a little bit different. This is a two-parter uh, that came to us from Jeff H. And he kind of had a change of heart midway through. So he says, hello, hosts. So I've read the book. I actually found it quite boring. I read a lot. And I'm not usually highly critical. But this is one of the few books I've read that I really was not moved by. Also, it's slim on plot. How do they stretch the book into three seasons? Are we going to have a whole season in Lakeside? So my questions, why did you like the book? How will they make an exciting series out of this book? Did you find the first two episodes fulfilling? He says, I love your podcast. Sorry to be so negative, Jeff. And then he wrote a little bit later, I realized I was being very negative. So I should say... Ian McShane is great, and I even like the blank slate quality of Shadow Moon. I also very much enjoyed the slave ship monologue last episode. I'm also pleased to see issues of belief, race, immigration, and Native people's stories on TV. Overall, though, next episode better be great for me to stick around. And that comes from Jeff H. I like it, Jeff. You see, you're going through kind of what we deal with. Uh, a lot of times, our first take, doesn't always pan out when we've had some time to sit down and reflect. And we used to get into trouble with Westworld on the the instant cast where we would just say what was first coming to us. And it, it wasn't that it wasn't thoughtful because we always put thought into it, but it wasn't it wasn't a completely vetted thought and we hadn't had time to really digest it. But uh, unfortunately, Gene, I can't answer you know most of his questions because I haven't read the book. All right, I'll take these point by point. So the first one, why did I like the book? So for me, Neil Gaiman comes from a... He's best known for Sandman comics, graphic novels, and stuff like that. He Then he wrote the novels American God and Everywhere. But in American Gods, uh, what he did was really interesting. He took the spirit of a graphic novel, this very big idea that's very, uh, at the same time, very comic booky, right? Old gods, new gods, battle, right? And And how does it play out? So he took this idea, but what you don't get in a lot of graphic novels, with the exception of Alan Moore and some other very specific writers, if you're looking at the most of the big names, the, the Frank Millers of the world, and, and you're looking at their comics, or their graphic novels, if you break down how much actual copy there is in there, it's not much. There's not a lot of writing. There's a lot of pictures, and they, they explain quite a bit. There's there's context. You're, you're taking in a multi-media uh, experience, right, or a, or a multi-medium experience. So if you look at it from that perspective, what, what made American Gods different and interesting is that it was a novel format, uh, much mi like Mike Mignola did with the Hellboy series. And you said, okay, this allows us to give so much rich detail, but it's not being drawn out for you. So your imagination gets to play on these things. 
And I think that's what makes the show great is that they took the same content out of a book and they allowed the artists, and clearly they are artists that are working on this show, to let their imaginations run wild with the descriptions and the actions that they got. And what we got was a very beautiful and interesting to look at show that can be very upsetting at times. It could be very exhilarating at times. And I think that that's what makes it so superior to a lot of other shows right now, as far as the excitement goes, is that we're getting to see Neil Gaiman's words trigger other artists' imaginations and and we get a, a great finished product. So you and I were having a conversation after we recorded the deep dive about some of the differences between the book and the show. And I was surprised to hear from you that the show had actually pushed the boundaries further than the book did. Do you feel like they're pushing it just to push it, or does it actually make the story better? Oh, no, I think that actually answers Jeff's second question, which is how they make an exciting series out of this book. He is absolutely right. There's not a lot of plot in this story. There's a lot of action, but that's different from plot, right? The development, the story arc, uh, that classic hero's tale. It's not exactly what you're going to get here. Instead, you're going to get a lot of sensory overload. You're going to get a lot of action, and you're going to get a a fairly simple storyline with a lot of complex characters, right? I think that they absolutely are, are being intentional. We talked about it before. With the Bilquis scene, uh, you know the the gratuitous nudity, uh, the the buckets of blood flying in off the sides of the screen. A lot of that's not necessary. You could tell the same story with a lot less, but it doesn't mean it's an, it's not fun. No, I think it's definitely fun. But I'm talking more about you know plot points that the show is pushing. Like you had a problem with the entire uh, gravesite discussion, you know, with Shadow, where he's propositioned for a blow job and and the urinating on the grave, and you said, you know, that's not in the book. If it's not in the book, and that really didn't serve a plot point, why are they doing it? I don't know, and that that actually was a conversation that had between uh, that happened between the showrunners and Neil Gaiman, where he said, you know, because originally they wanted to have Audrey blow Shadow in the graveyard, and he was like, absolutely not. That is not what my character would do. He's hurt. He's heartbroken. It's his wife's grave. He still loves her. Like, why would he accept a blowjob in that scenario? And they're like, you know, they countered, well, he just got out of prison, which is what Raj said. And he was like, no, he goes, Neil Gaiman was quoted as saying that he would, you know, he would walk out in front of a bus and they'd find a suicide note saying that it was their fault that he had died. Uh, They are pushing the envelope in a lot of ways, and I think it is for TV. I don't think it's necessarily um, in any way to enhance the storyline. But at the same time, it's making it a show worth talking about. It's making it very interesting. I've seen several book adaptations on television that were very accurate and incredibly boring. So the final question is, did we find the first two episodes fulfilling? I did. I really liked the first two. I look forward to six more. It is an interesting idea of how the hell they're going to stretch the story out for you know multiple seasons. The, the word, again, that we've repeated several times that this is only supposed to get, this season is only supposed to get a third of the way through. And I think the only way they're going to be able to do that is to have several more of these Chernobog scenes that last, you know, it seems like 15 minutes of, of dialogue between two guys at a table. Uh, for me, the first episode was tough. I wasn't completely f- sold on the series when you guys brought it up. And I said, you know what, I'll give it a chance. Because it's always each one of us has our own uh, personal opinions and what we enjoy watching. And I said, you know what, this is one I'll I'll defer to you guys and and give it a chance after the first episode i was like what is going on and part of that was my fault because i didn't even go watch the trailers i didn't want to know what i was getting into i i didn't know that it was old gods versus new i didn't know the the basic premise of of the gods being alive in modern day america i didn't know any of it so that made the first episode difficult to get through in between one and two, I sat down and watched Out with the Old. It was a Stars video that gives you a three-minute lay of the land and kind of introduces you to the world of American gods. With that and the first episode, I really enjoyed the second. There's nothing they could do now, I think, that would shock me or would get me to turn it off. So for that, yeah, first one, eh, a little lost. Second one, yes, fulfilling. And And the way I also judge it, I am like three episodes behind on two of my favorite shows right now. Like The Leftovers, I love. Roger hates it. Gene's never seen it. I love The Leftovers. But because of what we're doing with the movies and recording this, I'm two behind on that and three behind on Better Call Saul. 
So the fact that I'm making time and excited to see American Gods tells me, yeah, it's fulfilling for me. So thank you for your very balanced series of emails, Jeff. Uh, moving on, we've got uh, one from Gillian. <laughs> this one is basically just a, a love letter to, to Big D. She says, D, look, you're awesome. Thank you for looking out for us females out there and being very open to seeing dongs all over the place and getting tired of the exploitation of just female nudity. Thank you for seeing the imbalance of male versus female nudity. But just so we're clear, and this is coming from a North Jersey gal, there is nothing cute about dicks. Big, small, chode, curved, thin, bendy, inverted, uncircumcised. There is nothing attractive or artistic or beautiful about a handless baby arm hanging from the crotch of anyone. It is not something that I see and think, oh my God, yes, dick, finally, so hot. No, not at all. Bill Quist naked, slinking all over a couch, that's hot. That's beautiful. Ross from Game of Thrones with her red hair, pale skin, and sick curves, that was beautiful. Dolores and Maeve stark naked, that's beautiful. But dicks, think about it now. They are legit baby arms without hands hanging there, just boom. Nothing to remark about, nothing pretty or cute, nada. So thank you, D, for trying to get one for the women. But in this one woman's opinion, there ain't nothing cute or arousing about dicks, especially if they were supposed to be attached to Dane Cook, who I'm almost positive does not have a good looking dick. So Gillian, I don't think a dick is that ugly in its normal flaccid state. When a guy's junk gets engorged and he gets an erection, it looks aggressive. It looks like it's ready to attack, like it's some form of alien. And I think that's what we don't like. I'd be curious to hear if you you think the penis is is less offensive in its natural state. I think a a big part of it is let's get to the context in which it was presented. So it was a, it was a dick pic. Now dick pics are just flat out gross. And and here's the thing: if a woman wants to send you a nude photo, whether it be via Snapchat or uh, or a Polaroid or whatever, right? It's normally like their body, at least a, a large part of it. Very rarely is somebody just going to send a picture of a vagina. Guys, though, for some reason, I don't know if it's just because it's right there, you got the camera, whatever, I don't know what it is, self-consciousness, whatever. Guys are very apt to just send the dick. And part of me thinks, bear with me here, Big D, part of me thinks is that if you send a picture of just the dick by itself, there's no, there's no reference point, right? So people might no. not know if it's a big dick or a small dick, it's just, it's just a dick, right? But that in and of itself is like saying, you know, the, the message there is you want to see just this. This is the important part of me. And that's a little repulsive. Yeah. So I've been married to my wife now going on. And I got to think about this. I think it's 14 years. So we started dating, got married before the whole Tinder, before all the online dating. Uh, so I kind of missed all this. I've never, I can say in my entire life, ever sent a dick pic. Here's my thing is I assume that anything that's sent electronically uh, is it's going to be out there. Someone will find it, you know. And so for me, it's just more of a it's not a, it's a privacy concern. It's just like a, that that could get out there somewhere. It's the same reason like I wouldn't make like a sex tape. It's just like it's too it's way too risky. And I've got a pretty decent memory. So I just it doesn't need to happen. And I, I feel like I do need to this is going to get really soapboxy here. But I do feel like, guys, just another pointer here. If you send one unsolicited, that is essentially sexual assault. It is at, at the very least sexual harassment if it's not asked for, because you're basically forcing a person to look at you, which is which is gross. So don't do that. I had a friend come down and visit over the holidays once, and I thought he was a good match for one of my coworkers. They hit it off. They were both into sci-fi. They liked video games. They were relaxed. It seemed like they really had a good time. I brought him over to a party that I had with probably like 15 friends hit it off they start talking and then one day my coworker comes and she says do me a favor have your friend not call me and i said why i said but what happened i said you guys were really hitting it off she goes i thought we were hitting it off too until he sent me this and she turns her phone over uh, and there is my good friend's dick he actually did send an unsolicited dick pic to my coworker so the only thing worse than a unsolicited dick pic is one that you send to a friend's coworker and then force them to look at it and potentially have an HR issue. Yeah, that's that's a bit compromising. No, yeah, no, no, that's that is definitely not okay. I also want to point out a uh, total side note, but Jez Bell, in addition to being a, a wonderful writer, is a wonderful graphic artist and actually sent me side by side photos 
of episode two, the bedroom scene, where I thought there was an iPad with the dick on it. It was, in fact, a framed photo of Shadow and Laura Moon, which he then imagined was the dick after seeing it on the phone. I thought it was a, an iMessage relay that went to the iPad, but in fact, no, it was a framed photo, which also stocking stuffer this year, number one, is going to be framed photo of uh, Dane Cook's dick. And finally, last but not least, from Mark, we have an email. It is a long one and it's very insightful. He's a guy who, uh, who's who been listening to Westworld and Taboo, but this is the first time he's writing in. And he starts off with the idea of parents are gods in the eyes of their children. As a child, these beings which give you life, reared you, nurtured you, are indeed gods. And you love them as such. But as you get older, reach the years of rebellion and individuality, you see them in a different light. They are now humanized and as such flawed. They are no longer the repository of all knowledge, the strongest. They are now simply human adults, your parents. It is not that they are less loved. They are simply not gods anymore. For what we've seen, the gods are brought to America, and over the years they are put aside for other gods, never to be as strong as they once were in their heyday. Their stories are kept alive as meat for our stories, but not revered or even thought upon by most. It's why they are soiled, destitute, hungry, and made to search for sustenance in this land, such as other immigrants. As for the scene of Anansi, I actually love that scene. Being a being which is the spirit of knowledge through stories, there is no frame of reference for it. It is simply told directly within the minds of the worshiper, allowing its meaning to frame within and gain the wisdom of his words. A trickster, like other trickster mythological creatures, appears to you either meek or of exaggerated confidence, but always with a message which cuts through you to the core. And Anansi gave them such a message. Would it have been simpler to have freed the slaves? in a rather clean and less crowded slave ship, and shown them the way back home? Yeah, but that's not the moral of the story which he told. He gave them a glimpse in the futility of their prayers of wanting to be delivered from freedom. They are currently in the area of slavery, in which, if it wasn't them to be taken for slavery, it would be one of countless millions, since they met their demise at the bottom of the sea from the passage, which became slaves and the meat of the machine which ground them into the people which you see today. And even then, still in the process of battling stereotypes, that scene resonated with me, fully understand it, fully entranced by the actions which his word incites. As James Baldwin states, the fire next time. As for Shadow, he is simply the current state of man, unbelieving in the stories of gods, confused as to what he sees in front of him, but unable to deny it because now he sees it. It's a slow process from his mind being jailed to being free. You start with cynicism and end with understanding and acceptance. But as the story unfolds, where do you go from there? Thanks again for your time, Mark D. Uh, I mentioned this on the deep dive that I thought one of the highlights of the last episode was Bill Quist that I had a chance to actually see what her motivations were. She wasn't just a predator consuming her prey in, in a hotel. I hope, as the series goes on, that they do show how did Bill Quist go from the Queen Sheba to working what looks like a seedy motel. I'd like to see how she got there. I think that's a core component to us caring about the gods. Something that Mark speaks to that really caught my interest is that, you know, in all of this, as we're explaining it away, we keep treating these people as just people. And and I think that's a mistake because we now know that there are these beings that are something beyond just people. So there's a symbolism in all that. And I think that's something that we've really, because the symbols are embedded in the people rather than in physical objects, we've really overlooked that on the show. But think about that when you're treating each of these characters, when you're observing these characters, when you're watching the way they interact with each other and what their motivations are, that everyone's meant to represent something. So as, as he said, Anansi is representative of knowledge through stories and a trickster. Shadow is representative of the current state of man. The gods themselves are essentially representative of the plight of the immigrant. Um, the immigrant identity even, perhaps, where you have that that strength of identity when you come to this country and then eventually fades away into these new gods that you worship and, and, and your culture becomes dissolved or, or at least diluted. So there's so much going on here that's beyond bloodbaths and dick pics and people getting their asses kicked and getting drunk. There's a lot more uh, going on here, and it's something that I think is operating at different levels, much less like a Disney movie can operate for both the parents and the children. I think this is there's a lot of eye candy, there's a lot of action, but there is some real depth in the symbolism. Oh, and I think it's making a, a really profound commentary on modern day life, on modern faith. Yeah, we see the decline of the formal church. 
that congregation size is shrinking and that less and less Americans consider themselves a devout follower. Technology has dominated. Now in a world where you used to have to actually trust your parents or trust what your pastor told you or you didn't have access to the internet. If somebody told you a rainbow was God showing that he, he loved you, you would believe that. But now you could just, if you're a kid, you Google it and you say, no, it's just light refracting through the, the water droplets in the sky. And you slowly lose that mysticism in their faith. We had this discussion before in the modern world. I don't see a way that if power is dictated by the amount and the devotion of your followers, how the old gods can ever come back. You and I have had this discussion because I'm not a book reader, but if you're weighing media's power with technical boy against a Nazi and Bill Quist, and it's going to be a bloodbath. Uh, I unless something turns the tide, that the established old gods start doing some visible miracles to get people back on board. I don't see any way that this story ends well for the old gods. All right. And that concludes this week's episode of Shout on TV, American Gods Confessional. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shout on TV. Facebook, search for Shout on TV Podcast. The website is ShoutOnTV.com. Again, if you want to write and be on the American Gods Confessional, go to hosts at ShoutOnTV.com. Email us there and tell us what you think. We're everywhere fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. And if you stop by iTunes, please be sure to give us a five-star review. That really helps us grow. Also, you can check out our store on the website for cool Shout on TV merchandise that helps keep the lights on. Finally, if you like Shout on TV, check out our sister podcast, Shat the Movies, where we review the best 80s and 90s movies from our childhood that you, the audience, vote for. Check out all that information at ShatTheMovies.com. Big D just finished the episode of GoldenEye, or the edit of GoldenEye. It's out there right now. You can enjoy it immediately. Or you can turn on your Nintendo 64 and play the video game, which is far superior. So on behalf of my co-hosts, Big D and Roger Roper, I'm Gene Lyons. Be sure to join us on Tuesday for our next American Gods Deep Dive, where we'll be covering episode three of the Star Series. 